In this episode, we'll be talking about two kinds of thinking about what's true. We'll talk about what happens when you forget about morals and how to use storytelling to build emotional connections and business benefits. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Annette Simmons, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to do more things that make you proud by designing and delivering services that are good for people and business. My guest in this episode is a writer of four books on storytelling. And the first book has been in print since 1997 and has been translated into 15 languages. I've read one of her books, which really inspired me as a service designer. So I needed to invite her on the show. Her name is Annette Simmons. The main theme of this episode is what is the price we pay as a society when we misuse storytelling just for profit. That's what this episode is all about. If you're new to the service design show, be sure to subscribe as we bring new videos every week. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to also check out our Instagram page where we post behind the scenes what happens here on this show. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Annette. Welcome to the show, Annette. Thanks. I'm really excited to have you on. You're an atypical guest for the service design show, and I really like that. <laughs> I'm atypical across the board, but okay. <laughs> Let, we'll, we'll see if that's true in this episode. For the people who don't know in who you are... In a good way. In a good way. For, for the people who don't know who you are, um, could you give like a 30-second introduction? Yeah, I wrote a book called The Story Factor, and uh, it really hit. That was back in the year 2000. It was it was only one of the four books I've written, but I started working on story from the point of view of how to get people to tell the truth to each other. And then, because I had a marketing background, I began to see how story works to frame something as either good or bad. Um, and so then I wrote Whoever Tells the Best Story Wins, and now... The Story Factor is coming out in a third edition in October. That, that's one of the reasons why I invited you. I read the Story Factor in my early days as a service designer and it had great influence on me. So uh, I'm yeah. glad. Yeah, you inspired me in that's that sense. Cool. And I think... Uh, i love to hear that. <laughs> and I think more uh, service designers should be aware of storytelling. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, in our uh, ramp up for this uh, talk, um, we were emailing back and forward and you said, I actually never heard of the term service design, although you use the word design thinking. And this is really funny because um, I always ask my guests what was the first time you came in touch with service design. Well, <laughs> the, the, answer hey, in, the answer is pretty short this time. So um, we'll be learning a lot from you and maybe you'll learn something from our community this time. Already have. You sent me three um, topics that are related uh, to the upcoming edition of the Story Factor. Uh, mm -hmm. So it must be dear to your heart uh, what we'll be talking about. And uh, we'll be doing interview jazz. Are you ready to start? I am. I am. Let's go. I'll pick the first topic that you send me, and you have the uh, what well, the notorious design show Q, uh, question starters. So the first topic we'll be talking about is two kinds of thinking. Yeah, yeah, and so. My uh, approach is how can we keep both of them strong? Let's so, start with what are the two kinds of thinking? The way I think about it, and of course, this, this is a fundamental, uh, that some people may even call it right brain, left brain. Mm -hmm. Some people, um, uh, but I call it objective versus subjective. And, and basically all I'm saying is there's two ways of knowing something is true. The objective way is to measure it, and then you understand the metrics, and then you can make sure you're accurate. And proof is very important. Mm. 
Well, the subjective way of knowing, uh, just knowing that uh, your child loves you, that's a sensory experience. Mm, and it's an mm. internal experience, and it includes emotions. And so our subjective experience is really where we decide whether we have we feel like this is good service or not. Or so <clears throat> subjective things aren't don't operate by the same rules as objective things. If they did, we could analyze, slice and dice and hack it. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you think about, okay, a kitten is cute. So I can bring a kitten into a hotel lobby and all of a sudden I'm making people happy. But if we then go in there and we try to figure out how do kittens make people happy? Hmm, hmm. Perhaps we need to take a kitten, slice it in half and examine both sides. <laughs> We've just destroyed yeah, that yeah, which yeah. we seek to understand. And so the subjective aspects um, of, of service are the, the, the things that are variable in the specific. And you can't program that out. You can't program happy. And and so protecting this concept um, from from the rigid sort of, you know, uh, and then the idea of consistency. Consistency is only quality when it's consistently good. Consistency by itself mm -hmm. is just the hobgoblin of little minds. So subjective things things need their own their own tools and storytelling. Bar none is the best tool I've ever run across for understanding the subjective. Mm. And um, I look, you know, if you think about storytelling, storytelling is is an evolutionary uh, aspect that that we we talk about. Okay, and it's as big as religion. It's actually in terms of trying to grasp storytelling, it's actually bigger than religion. Mm. I would say uh, religion is a subset of storytelling. So what are the tools we use? Well, we're talking art instead of science. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a problem when you're trying to science the shit out of something. <laughs> um, and one of the things I love about service design thinking is that it balances um, what should work, which is the objective world, with what does work, which for me is the subjective mm. world. And so, for instance, uh, customer service in a hotel, one of my favorite memories of really brilliant customer service was I was frustrated, I was tired, I was exasperated, and I was in a country where I didn't even know what country I was in. And I can remember going up, pulling the, the card key, it didn't work in the, in the door, and you're like, oh crap, now I have to go back downstairs. Go back downstairs, I, I, hit, I show her the key, and I say, this key doesn't work. Now, her response was, oh, that might be because this key isn't for this hotel. <laughs> and then we both <laughs> laughed. Mm -hmm. But another way to solve that would be someone say, oh, you're right. And not even to mention it was the wrong key, wrong hotel key, right? And deliver it. So being kind, being nice is very situationally specific. And so when we use a story like the one I just told about the key card, my hope is that our customer service people understand that they can use their sense of humor. Mm. Mm. It is possible. And, and so that they have a, a very autonomous approach um, to being nice, if we're going to use that one. So many things that already uh, sort of crossed my mind. And one of the uh, things is... Uh, the way you're uh, talking about subjective and objective thinking, it reminds me, and I always uh, uh, mess them up or misline them, is um, abduct abductive thinking, inductive thinking, and deductive th thinking. Right. Like uh, th Those are like almost parallel with, with what you're describing. And the, the thing... In a, in a way, but in cho a way? chopped up. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Well, it, uh, the other uh, trigger for me was um, uh, we as a sort of service design community always struggle to prove, feel the need to prove the value of our work. And we know that it's valuable and it, we know that it helps to create a better world. But, you know, we can't quantify it. We just feel that it, uh, it is so. Yeah. And the, the harder we try to quantify it, the less believable absolutely it, it, it becomes you kill the kitten you kill the kitten as soon as you start and and that's really hard if you're in a business 
setting. Yeah. But I, just to give an example where um, we, we were sort of, again, in the email conversation uh, leading up to this interview, I said we sort of in, embedded storytelling in every aspect of what we do at our studio and also like in the proposal stage. Mm -hmm. And I just tell stories from past projects and um, be, like people see that as evidence. They don't need Absolutely. numbers. They don't need uh, hard data. They just hear stories, um, real life stories, and then that's enough. And that's really yeah. hard to explain to other yeah. service designers that it works that way, but it works. <laughs> I would, you know, I would even go so far as to say trust is a subjective experience. Hmm. And so what, when we tried to hack trust, and hopefully most of us have moved on, um, then, then what, what we looked at is proof, you know, and that's a linear format and that works in the objective world, but in the subjective world, experience mm. is what, uh, is works as, as well as proof. Mm. And mm. so experience, my, my definition of story is if experience is the best teacher, story is second best because mm. it's a simulated experience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And when we find those stories that have that strong emotional pull, um, then, w then we're starting to understand what matters to people. Hmm. And just because we can't slice it and dice it and put it into a uh, quantity does not mean that it's not the most important thing if we're actually going to give good service. Yeah, th that's a great point, the making the distinction be between trust and proof. Like you... You, you don't need proof to build trust, right? That's right. Well, by definition, trust is without proof. Is, is that so? So, yeah, well, think about it. Faith, trust, hmm. means that you are willing to, to move into a, a, a collaborative situation without any guarantees. Otherwise, that's called a contract. Hmm. 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 So hmm. trust is by... So, so when I first wrote the story factor, one of the things that I said is that, that, that you know, people do not want more information from you. What they want is faith. Hmm. They want faith that you're a good person, that you're here for the right reasons, and that if all hell breaks loose, you're on their side. Yeah, yeah. And that, and that's, by definition, I would also call that trust. Hmm. And so, so to, to be able to, to understand that we're not, we're not, we're out here where the buses don't run, you know, when we're talking about trust. Ah, so many things, but, uh, I, I know we have, uh, there, there is a buildup in the topics we have. So let's, let's use our time wisely and sort of try to move into, uh, from the, this conversation about trust, um, move into the second topic. And not sure if I uh, narrowed it down to two words correctly, but uh, I have moral systems as a topic here. Okay. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna let's just just talk, just start at the beginning, which is why do we need morals? Why do we care? That's a big question. So I'm I'm pretty sure no business person is gonna say you know my job is to to save the rest of the world, even though <laughs> frankly it is. Um, but morals. It's just like that faith. You find morals where you find emotions. And you find emotions where you find morals. And so if we're talking about, you know, what is it to be kind? Um, what it, you know, how do you define nice? It's different in, in every single situation. I will give one specific circumstance. Um, if I am going to be providing good service, I need to work in a community. And I really love that y'all get that it's about the community. I need to work in a community where I'm not afraid to make a mistake. I need to work in a community where I think things are fair. Okay. Fair mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. huge driver for mm -hmm. human beings. So here's, let's look at fair. Fair is whoever needs it the most gets the most, like the people after the hurricane. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, no, no, no. Fair is um, that we all share equally. Well, wait a minute. Fair, <laughs> I, I worked my butt off for this. I just spent ten years working on it. Fair is whoever spent the whoever worked the hardest. Mm -hmm, you just mm -hmm, you just came mm -hmm. in here. You want to monetize me? Well, no, 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 no. Fair is whoever brings in the most bucks, right? Yeah. 
or fair could be um and i always forget the fifth one fair <laughs> could be oh whoever got there first uh -huh. whoever's been here the longest mm. you know i get the most because i've been here the longest well in our communities to create a situation where we understand the concept of fair in a shared way that takes uh stories because if we make it uh tactical and and you know well, fair means that everybody gets the same, which is what HR would do, right? Everybody treat you the same. Mm -hmm. Well, people out in the field, they're like, are you crazy? You know, I've got some really talented people here. Fair is, you know. And so, so storytelling is the way for us to look at these, these moments uh, where we feel connected. And we feel connected when things are fair. We feel connected when people um, are kind. Uh, when they're tolerant. And so understanding these, okay, so one of the things that I talk about is the King Midas. King Midas as a spreadsheet. Uh, translate, and basically the story is that, you know, King Midas wanted to, everything he touched to turn to gold. And uh, then he touched his daughter and he killed her. Hmm. He turned her into a gold statue. Well, as a story, that's real clear, the knowingness of what is right and wrong. You put that on a spreadsheet, man, you got return on investment infinite. <laughs> and all you have to do is, you know, so, uh -huh. so understanding that the morals are where people care. Not just that I would like the world to continue to exist, which I would, but um, we need morals uh, if we want people to feel connected. Because the, the function of disconnection is immorality. Hmm. And stories are the way to sh share morals? Okay, well, here, here's, here, here's my idea. And it's not just my idea. Evolutionary psychology has um, demonstrated that, you know, evolution invented emotions for a reason. Um, and, uh, and evolution invented this whole storytelling thing where you, you tell circumstances where you have strong emotions of what you do want and strong emotions about what mm. you don't want. We learn how to be human beings through these stories. If evolution was reinforcing stories so we continue to survive, its agenda would be the, the good of the, the many over the good of the few. So when we look at uh, this profit, you know, sort of uh, frame, and everything has to have a return on investment by the end of the first quarter, then all you're doing is reinforcing the individual is more important than the collective. Hmm. Hmm. And that's and and you can see what's happened in American politics. All these fear stories. That's what happens when you optimize the individual. And to everybody who doesn't li live in America, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> We're trying to get our act together. <laughs> we uh, hope that gets better. <clears throat> How would, um, because this is a really important point, and I think um, on a daily practice, I don't think about uh, a, a deep level like uh, morals and the way stories yeah. uh uh, uh, impact that now that you're now that you've shared this how, how do you could you give us some advice to the design community how we could use or leverage this in our day-to-day -day practice right i first of all i would i would uh, recommend that you go back to the original source um so all of these old myths and and that sort of stuff existed for a reason and and they carry in them these collaborative uh frameworks and lessons and all that sort of stuff. So um, recently I was looking at, at the way that people are treating stories right now. And mm -hmm. so there was a TV show uh, that talked about hero stories. And the hero story they chose to tell was they called it um, Ivan and the Deathless Wizard. Well, I know that story as... Maria Martin, Maria, I can't remember the last mm -hmm. name. It's a Slavic story. 
And through the hero story, they just went straight to how Ivan has to go and capture this wizard who uh, has captured Ivan's wife, Maria. Well, the way I heard the story was, number one, Maria is the queen of the castle where they live. Maria is the warrior princess. And Maria had to go fight a war. And so she told her husband, Ivan, to leave that door locked. Mm -hmm. And then she went off. Now, we know what happened. Ivan can't stand. He's going to open the door. And that's where the wizard is. And that's how the wizard got out in the first place. The next thing they, they left out was the three, what I call the three creatures. When you leave the hero, uh, when the hero leaves, they don't just leave the unknown and go into the, I mean, the known mm -hmm, and go mm -hmm, into the unknown. Mm -hmm. All of these Let's leave out the three creatures, which is there's a little bird that needs um, some food or there's uh, a baby fawn that mm. needs to be helped rescued. Now, the, the hero traditionally does these three acts of random kindness, generosity. And the reason he does it is because way down the road, those three little creatures are going to be, you know, saving mm -hmm. his ass. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So if we look at these random kindnesses, just by studying the myths in their form before they got digitized, we will find some amazing, beautiful uh, ideas yeah, yeah. about, you know, uh, what does it take to create random kindnesses? And how do we develop stories that associate these long-term benefits when there's no, there's no argument that there's a short-term mm -hmm, mm -hmm. cost. And so a lot of the, oh, and, mm, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, be diplomatic here. I have an issue about the term cognitive bias. Okay. The term cognitive bias, um, like loss avoidance and all that sort of stuff, actually to me, is is um, evolution's little guidelines for what how emotions should be biasing our actions mm -hmm. in ways that the literal truth wouldn't necessarily. And so loss avoidance um, is not an error in judgment. It is a pattern of survival. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I, I just get, I just think that if we would take all the cognitive biases out of the error box and put them into the ex examination and, and let's see what's, what the benefit is there, I think the ideas would just flow. Hmm. Hmm. So <clears throat> what, I, what I, for instance, get out of this is, um, may maybe it's too simplistic, but I take the, go, you said go to the source, but also take... Take, when you're crafting a story, take the time to tell the whole story and don't oh, yeah. cut to the chase and, and make, make sure you, you tell the whole picture, right? Not, not yeah. just... The, one of the things for me that's missing from communications is, is the human presence. Hmm. And so when I teach communications um, at Brookings for Institute, for instance, one of the things I do is I use design thinking as mm -hmm. the framework for understanding how to design the communication. So most of these people are in workplaces where, you know, a lot of tension, a lot of stress, certainly right now. And so the discovery phase is understanding everybody else's story, what makes them think what they think. The, um, the patterns, I mm -hmm. mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's obvious. Yeah. But, but the guidelines, I would also say, is a place where we put a moral, uh, uh, ethical guideline because it's good for your image. Yeah. yeah Gillette yeah. put the, the yeah. video out just, just recently um, uh, about uh, toxic masculinity. Uh, Nike, mm -hmm. they're the ones mm -hmm. that put Colin Kaepernick. So ethics... Uh, if, if for no other reason, hmm. do actually heighten your visibility. Hmm. Hmm. Let's, let's, and we already touched upon this. So uh, let, let's just move into the, the third and, uh, and last topic. Uh, and you, again, you touched upon this and this is profit and connections, emotional connections. 
Yes. So what's the relationship is, is, is uh, one of the things, connections, um, will show up as uh, inefficiencies. Uh, back when, in the 80s, when I worked for Ericsson, we had tea breaks. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the, the tea lady with a little cart and you could hear the cups, you know, yeah. the real <laughs> thick glass clanking and all of us would like little lemmings come and, you know, <laughs> get our biscuit and our tea. And that experience of sharing information, we were in export, so we weren't always in the office at the same time. That was a, a functional exchange of information and positive feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, I get paid now to come in and teach storytelling. And teaching storytelling is fun, but I also, the way I teach it, help people to understand what each other's stories are. We move so fast, we don't know the story of the person in the, the you know cube next to us. And so if you look at it by removing that tea break, We've had had to actually add financial investment because we didn't realize we were throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. And so this whole idea that you've got to show a return on investment on every single little detail is um, we won't do it. We morals are going to require personal sacrifice if we're going to solve climate change, right? We're going to have to change the behaviors. And so the, the, the way that we can actually make our, our businesses more responsive and, and more inclusive is also going to be uh, a way to contribute to you know, whatever behavioral changes we're going to have to undergo before we get our act together on big global challenges. Mm. So the, the de, uh, de-emphasizing this, you know, uh, every single little detail, like with cars, you know, when they make cars, every one cent, you know, this counts one cent. And if you can take three cents off of it, I don't know if you've worked in automotive, no. uh, then you've, you've made a million dollars. Well, we're going to have to start to look at the long-term uh, payoffs and we have to budget for morals. Hmm. If we don't have a budget that takes care of ethical behavior, then, uh, I mean, because ethical behavior is always expensive. It costs you time or it costs you money. And if it hasn't lately, I'm not sure you still have it. So I'm well, sorry, you're trying to an, enter it. Well, that's an interesting uh, point that uh, ethics are expensive, right? That, that's what you said. Yes. What, what is the price of like not doing it, right? That's, that's the bigger question because eventually we'll die. Well, see, I do a lot of... I, I do a lot of uh, community work. I do a lot of social justice work. And so what I, what I do is you can't, you can't connect with somebody if you can't identify with them. And so I'm usually in a situation where people underserved and they're trying to, to communicate to whoever is, you know, basically oppressing them mm -hmm. um, or who's saying they're, they're not worthy of, you know, a place to live or whatever because they don't work hard enough. Um, what I'm trying to do is to understand for them, in order to, to get into their creative intelligence, they've got to have some positive story to tell themselves about whoever they consider you know, to be the bad guy. And here's what I, the story I tell myself. To be uh, an exploiter, uh, to actually exploit every opportunity without leaving something on the table, uh, it turns you in, it dehumanizes you, and it isolates you. And it makes you afraid. And we call that anxiety in mm. today's world. Mm -hmm. And so when, when the, that's the price we pay, when we don't uh, allocate, when, we, you know, when I don't have enough cash in my pocket to give a homeless person while I'm walking down the streets of, of Durham downtown, I know what it takes for me to continue to love life. And I think that we want our employees and we want our consumers, you know, to love life. There's, mm. there's, but that is, that does uh, take a budget. Mm. What would your, <clears throat> if you could give uh, an advice regarding storytelling 
and then your your book is full of them so i would recommend everybody to buy the book and re just read the book well but october is when the, the third edition is, <clears throat> is out so until what, what tip would you give like if if you're going to learn about storytelling or um embrace storytelling in your own practice what would you say okay i believe that in order to learn how to tell stories the best place to start is how to tell your own story. Mm -hmm. So your story of who you are and why you're here. And what that will force you to do is to blend um, integrity because almost everybody's who I am story is a story of some sort of integrity. I mean, that's just the way we're made. I'll have to admit I've run across a, a few who I am stories and they were like, you know, I have this killer app and it really screwed all these people and now I'm a millionaire. But okay. Um, that's the, not the yeah, kind of people yeah, I yeah, want to help. Yeah. So who you are, and then um, I give four buckets. Uh, a time you shined, a time you blew it, which is also a really good time uh, that mm. shows what you'll never ha let happen again. A book or a movie, which is letting someone else who's an artist. And by the way, this is the story, the art part of story is the hard part. If you try to science story, all you, you get is a descriptive definition it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, which is like, that's useless. Hmm. Um, so, so find your who I am, why I'm here story. Tell it to somebody else, uh, and, and, and you'll begin to get the skills for what it takes to cause a story to do its work, which in this case would be, instead of you saying, my name is Annette, and I'm trustworthy, I can say... Um, this is what I did last week, and yeah. then you decide whether I was trustworthy, whether I am trustworthy. So that's does that is that advice helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's I, sort of it. It feels like uh, what you said. Start by l learn storytelling by telling your own story. Absolutely. I, I, it, it, that, uh, yeah, that's 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 great. Yeah. Yeah, too many people approach it um, in some sort of way that technically should work, but as we know in design thinking, <laughs> doesn't. So this mm. whole idea of testing stories um, as mm. a tangible whole, mm. uh, rather than trying to build elements of stories and then cram them all together. Mm. Awesome. I, I know you haven't prepared for this question, so you're going to have to improvise, but... Um, okay. Is there a thing you'd like to ask the viewers or the listeners of the of the show? Is there a thing you'd like us to think about? Um, I think this whole idea about uh, budgeting for morals or else using morals to find um, to find secrets for service. I would I'd like to know if that I mean I imagine that would be helpful, but I'm not sure whether it is. I'd really like to hear back if, if you don't if you think that has legs. Let us know in the comments. I'm really curious what people will say. Great topic for the design community. Perfect topic for the design community. And then I think we could spend another two hours uh, talking. This is, a, I, I think, uh, I'll try to address storytelling much more on the show in the coming episodes. Who knows what co will come up. But you, you did a great job sharing your perspective. So uh, thanks for making the time. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, letting me be part of the community for a bit. We embrace you and welcome you to our tribe. <laughs> thank you. So what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? And what is your perspective on Annette's question? Make sure to leave a comment down below. And if you know somebody who might benefit from the things we've just discussed, please share the link with them and help us to grow the community. And speaking about storytelling if you'd like to learn how to explain service design in a way that anyone understands make sure to check out the free course that i've got for you over here thanks again for watching and look forward to see you in the next video